I thank the President. I join my colleague from Washington to recognize the heroic efforts that are underway in the state of Washington, battling wildfires, the individuals that are trying to protect their homes and property, and our hearts go out to the families and friends of Robert Kazuski, a retired state trooper and veteran who suffered a heart attack while trying to save his own home. I want to thank the local, state, and federal agencies that are working together to meet the logistical needs of extinguishing these multiple fires and for the efforts that they've already done to help save lives and minimize damage in what is the largest wildfire in our state's history. I want to thank all the community organizing individuals who've done so much work in their individual communities to support the efforts of the firefighters and to work with everybody in the community to make sure that every aspect of uh, security and safety are there for the families who have lost their homes. And I want to thank the individuals who have been working to provide shelter and to help their neighbors no matter what it takes to help them. There is a huge uh, spirit alive uh, in the Okanagan of people who are working very hard to make sure that they are also contributing. They have a great deal of self-reliance uh, spirit, and they want to make sure that as FEMA and others are moving in, that they are also uh, responsible and helping with fighting the fires and to work to make sure as many people in the community can be saved from this devastation. So we are hearing many moving stories of Washingtonians donating their time, volunteering uh, goods, things that everybody in the community needs. And so I just want to thank the people of Washington and particularly the central part of the state for everything they're doing to help battle this fire. I also uh, came to the floor, Ma Madam President, to talk about the Export-Import Bank and the fact that we still need to work out a deal on the Senate floor so we can move this legislation. Time is running out. We only have a few days left here before the August recess and literally only a few legislative days when we return to make sure that we reauthorize this important credit agency that helps manufacturers export their product overseas. When you grow U.S. jobs, uh, when you grow U.S. manufacturing, you grow U.S. jobs. And what we want to do is to make sure that our manufacturers have a fair shot at getting their products sold overseas. So it makes no sense to me that the fate of an organization that is such an important tool to businesses and comes to no cost to the taxpayers can't get reauthorized. In fact, I'm sure that there are colleagues in the House of Representatives who would just, if they had a chance, just outright kill the credit agency altogether. Well, last week, uh, 31 governors signed a letter. 31 governors signed a letter that basically reauthorized the calling for the reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. And that brings the total number of governors to 37. So I'm proud that my governor, Jay Inslee, and along with Governor Robert Bentley from Alabama, led an effort to say to the Congress, this is an important thing to do. They see the results in their state as it relates to jobs, and they want to make sure that we get this reauthorized. There are governors from all over the political spectrum, liberal Democrats to moderate Democrats to moderate Republicans and even Tea Party Republicans. So there are governors out there. Uh, from Neil Abercrombie of Hawaii to Governor Paul LePage of Maine, who want to get this important tool reauthorized. And even though they are from many different spectrums, they see that this creates jobs in their states. I'd like to point out that nine of those signatures come from Republican governors, plus five Republican governors sent their own letter. So that's 14 Republican governors who joined a chorus and voices on the legislative body to make sure that we are doing what's right for the economy and renew this charter for the important Export-Import Bank. And I just want to point out from the letter, I want to point out from the letter that it basically says without the financing, U.S. firms would have lost sales to overseas competitors. And so this is what the governors are trying to tell us. They are stewards in their state of jobs in the economy, and they're very concerned about the Export-Import Bank. So. We want to make sure that we continue to listen to those governors and get their help in making sure their members of Congress from their individual states support this legislation. They also um, are talking to th 
thousands of small business owners who are saying that failing to reauthorize the Export Import Bank would lead to fewer exports and a loss of jobs in 50 states. And um, they are out there trying to make sure that they are drumming up support in the delegations uh, of their state congressional delegations. And that is because trade is a critically important aspect to our economy. I just talked to one of my colleagues today who was telling me how much their state uh, was recovering, but in the areas where they were doing the most exports, their state was uh, really growing, that particular part. In 2013, U.S. exports reached $2.3 trillion in goods and services. So exports across the nation attribute to the, uh, that are attributable to the Exim Bank uh, support about $37 billion worth of U.S. exports and about 205,000 related jobs. So you can see that the Export-Import Bank is a vital tool to creating jobs in our U.S. economy. And it does all of this returning $1 billion to the federal treasury. So to me, it is a win-win for taxpayers, and it's a good aspect for jobs. As I said, it's 205,000 export-related jobs and $3.7 billion uh, in exports. And that supports over 2,000 small businesses throughout our country. So that's actually the direct impact of businesses who are exporting with the help of the Export-Import Bank. So I, I say that because there's so many more people who are involved in the supply chain, and we talked about that last week. But I wanted to, Madam President, address one issue that is here today that I hear from a lot of colleagues. Well, isn't this just something the private sector can do? Well, I guarantee you if the private sector could just do it and would do it, we'd be very happy. So I'm here to debunk that myth. In fact, in the words of the private sector, it is all about them helping the help of the bank to actually make deals work. Anyone who thinks that they um, know what they're talking about, they should really, I want to make sure people clear, first and foremost, in the bank's charter, it prohibits it prohibits private firms and individuals from having, uh, it prohibits them from competing with private financing and requires that all financing have a reasonable chance of repayment. And so literally in the bank's charter, it says that they're not there to compete with these banks. And yet I hear so many times my colleagues on the other side trying to say, oh, well, this is just something that you know, we government shouldn't be involved in. I just pointed out that we actually make money off of it, so that part is really good for us because it helps us pay down the federal deficit. And I just mentioned how banks uh, want the partnership with this credit agency because it helps them, but it actually is not in their charter. I mean, it is in their charter that prohibits them from doing so. Specifically, uh, the charter says in section two that the bank uh, should supplement and encourage and not compete with private capital. Not compete with private capital. So there it is in their own charter exactly how they're supposed to operate. So this is not a bank that's somehow competing with banks across America. They are partnering with financial institutions who see risk in overseas markets that they think are undeveloped and don't have uh, the banking and financing institutions in their organizations to help get these things done. And so they want to partner with the Export-Import Bank. So it is helping businesses all across our country. And in fact, 98% of the Export-Import Bank's transactions are involved with banks uh, throughout 2013. So it isn't taking business away from them. It is actually, it is actually helping businesses throughout our country. So the Export-Import Bank is a leading uh, indicator for U.S. companies in how to get business done in these developing markets. And it is often in the national and local uh, banking uh, interest to have a partner like this because they see deals and opportunities that come through their local communities. Uh, I know that there are banks, the presiding officers, uh, uh, major banks in parts of the Midwest, Key Bank, others, you know, have talked to me about how important it is because they have homegrown businesses that come to them. They see the opportunity, but they also see the risk. 
and having this credit agency be a partner with that local bank helps them secure the deal. So as uh, we look at this chart, it basically shows that 98% of the XM Bank transactions are involving commercial banks. So again, this notion that somehow this bank is competing with the private sector when in fact it's basically prohibited in their charter and 98% of the deals are actually done with a, an individual bank shows that this is really a tool for our commercial banking. So these are banks everywhere from Alaska Commercial Fishing and Agriculture Bank in Anchorage to Wallace State Bank in Texas, as well as national banks like Wells Fargo and others. And so they find it a very, very viable tool and something that is important to do. Um, according to a recent statement by the Bankers for Finance and Trade and Financial Services Roundtable, the Export-Import Bank of the United States plays a critical role quote, in international trade by providing export financing products that fill the gap in trade financing that otherwise would not be provided by the private sector, end quote. So we're hearing from these individual banks who are saying this and basically articulating that this is a tool. In fact, uh, one CEO, John Stump from Wells Fargo, recently talked about his work with a company called Air Tractor. Air Tractor is a Texas company that manufactures agriculture aircraft with 50% of its businesses being overseas. And so he said how important it was that the export, I'm going to say, quote, air traffic wouldn't be there where they are today without the Export Import Bank, and there are certain things that would not have been done without them. So I want to go back to the fact that the banking industry really does believe that the Export-Import Bank is a necessary tool. The Export-Import Bank is a vital partner for the lending community, according to the Bankers Association. So, Madam President, I think that this shows you that uh, there are people who are just not educated on the structure of the bank, how it works, how important it is to be an important tool for us. So I just want to make sure that um, we, you know, understand uh, why the private sector can't do these loans themselves. So now if people understand how the bank works and now they want to come back and say, well, they still should be doing it themselves, um, I want to go to one chart that basically uh, shows some of the challenges that bankers face when they are dealing with this. They face bank balance sheet limitations. Uh, that is uh, the ability to hold all of those deals on their books over the period of the loan. They have the added risk of exporting to foreign markets, which uh, um, can be challenging at best, and the lack of the financial sector presence in those emerging markets. So all of those things, if you're, as I just mentioned, um, one of these banks from the Wallace State Bank in Texas or Alaska Commercial Fishing and Agriculture Bank, you can see that they want to help this business in their state export, or like in this company that I mentioned, the Air Tractor in Texas, who manufactures aircraft uh, for agriculture purposes, you can see that they want to help them. But again, is Wallace Bank going to be able to go out and assess all these international marketplaces and assess whether that uh, in customer is going to be able to continue to pay on the life of this purchase? No, this bank isn't, isn't figuring out uh, how to do that. So basically, they're just turning this business down. And yet, we have a US manufacturer who's figured out a great product, figured out how to make it, figured out how to get customers overseas, figured out how to compete with international competitors. And we have people here strangling the one tool that they need, the credit agency that helps the local bank and their community finance the deal. So Madam President, I um, just want to say that I hope that we resolve this issue with the Export-Import Bank. I hope that our colleagues on both sides of the aisle can come to terms with the amendments that are necessary to move this bill to the Senate floor. I know that um, last time we had a similar debate and a lot of discussion, but in the end there was about 79 votes for the Export-Import Bank. Um, well, I guess I would ask all my colleagues now to think about our economy and how much U.S. manufacturers need to sell in overseas markets. We are having 
an unbelievable uh, growth in a middle class around the globe. It's going to double in the next 15 years. That's 2.7 more billion uh, middle class consumers that could buy U.S. products and U.S. services, but they won't if we hamstring the export import credit agencies that help support banks in the financing of U.S. manufactured goods sold overseas. So I hope that my colleagues will help us get this bill to the floor, get it reauthorized, and not for short term, not for three months, not for more uh, mischief to be had, but to give predictability and certainty to people who are actually growing jobs in the United States of America, our manufacturers. So I thank the President and I yield the floor. Senator from Washington. I ask unanimous consent that the confirmation votes on Menendez, Rogoff, and Andrews nominations occur following the vote to confirm Disbro nomination and all other provisions of the previous order remain in effect.